Hi, welcome to Asia in Review at ThinkTech Hawaii, coming to you from Pioneer Plaza at downtown Honolulu. I'm your host, Hong Jiang, Associate Professor at University of Hawaii at Manoa. And my special guest today is David Day, a leading international business lawyer. And our topic today is Russia Energy Moves to Asia. David Day is one of the Asian Pacific region's leading international legal practitioners with a special emphasis on Asia. He's been on the ground extensively throughout Asia in deal structuring and negotiations, and is currently involved in a variety of commercial projects in Indonesia, Vietnam, Singapore, China, and Japan. And in today's show, we're going to discuss Russia's expansion of energy pipelines into Japan and North and South Korea and implications of this move. And apparently, this is part, uh, part of Russia's pivot toward Asia. For those of you who are familiar with Think Tech shows, David is a longtime host of a Thursday's Asia in Review. And act, actually, he's my mentor by practice because I've just started to host Asia in Review uh, this year. So David, thank you so much for being here. Well, it's great to be here. And it's actually, I'm, I prefer to sit where I am because right, I just get to relax and answer the questions. And <laughs> that, that's you, right. You have to do all the work. So. Actually, since you've been hosting, you've been asking other people to speak about, about their work and themselves. Maybe you can tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, on the energy side, um, uh, I got interested in, in Russia's involvement in Asia at two levels. One is following APEC here in Hawaii in 2011, the, the Russia, the Russia hosted at Vladivostok in 2012. And then I've done, done a number of energy projects uh, in Southeast Asia, particularly with the Vietnamese negotiating with uh, Petro Vietnam on behalf of some American companies. And, and I, I see the Russian presence there in Vietnam uh, on the energy side. So it was, it was interesting to watch as the geopolitical winds and the business winds of Russia started to shift, and so they are now big players or coming on to be big players in, in, in our Asia Pacific region. And for our viewers, uh, what David is going to share today is, uh, to me, explosive, really, really important to see where Russia is placing itself in terms of uh, you know it's uh, moving out of Asia uh, to Asia. Uh, through its energy expansions. And uh, in terms of energy, this is uh, uh, some of the data I want to give our viewers some background. So uh, apparently Russia is rich in energy reserves. That's right. And uh, the data I have is uh, it has the largest known natural gas reserves, 32% of, uh, of a proven reserves uh, on um, of any state in the, you know, on Earth, right. and plus has a lot of uh, coal reserves and oil reserves and other things. So apparently, energy is important for Russia and for Russians, uh, Ru Russian economic policy, right? Well, it, I mean, to, to, to add to what you just said, Hong, the, the Russian economy is its energy, its energy export. And so it's sort of like Saudi Arabia. You know, if you take away Saudi's oil exports, what do they have? I mean, there's only so much sand you can use to make glass out of. So, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why energy is very key to watching the geopolitical winds shift for Russia. And we hear so much about the Middle East, about the Saudi Arabia, and I haven't heard much about Russia. So uh, today we, we get a, a, a kind of a treat to learn about uh, all the uh, what's happening with Russia. So uh, in terms of a pivot to Asia, what's the background? Well, I mean, we can see this this shift. I mean, there's, there's a piece of it that's business related, which we're going to be talking about in the show, that has to be the, the, the move from uh, shifting the focus from selling or exporting energy into Europe into Asia. Um, but we can also see this pivot in a Russian foreign policy or geopolitical sense in that if we if we just go back just recently the uh, uh, gaffes by Senator Kerry that led to the debacle with Syria brought Russia into prominence in involving the peace and, and negotiations for chemical weapons in, in, in the Syrian war um, and now we see Russia moving into Egypt for sale of arms um, because of a vacuum created by US military sales being halted into Egypt uh, and so the, the old allies between Egypt and Russia rekindled. Mm -hmm. And we know that Russia has its client state as Iran. 
in, in, in the Middle East. And so now we see a shift into Asia. And it just, just a couple of weeks ago, Putin was in Vietnam and negotiated a mutual defense treaty. He was there for the delivery of the first uh, Russian uh, silent submarine to the Vietnamese, new, uh, new class of submarine. And um, uh, he, he was there to set up some joint venture work between Petro Vietnam, the Seidon oil company in Vietnam, and some of the Russian firms for joint oil exploration, not only in the South China Sea, mm -hmm. but also in the Arctic Sea. And the, mm -hmm. the idea of the Vietnamese working with the Russians in the Arctic Sea is, is, uh, is very interesting. So we can see, in addition to this energy shift, you know, the beginnings of a geopolitical shift that follows Russia's pronouncement at uh, Vladivostok, APEC, 2012, mm -hmm. we want to be a player in the Asia region. And so we can start to see that now. Um, so uh, apparently, Russia has been kind of connecting everywhere with, with people from the tropics to the Arctic. Yeah, I mean, uh, they were thought of as a kind of as a has-been power after the mm -hmm. Cold War, and a, a series of events have occurred that have allowed them to step firmly back on the world stage. You know, they're kind of like saying, we're back. That's right, that we didn't leave in a way. Right. Oh, right, oh right, un right. unwilling to leave and coming back. But in terms of uh, the role of energy, <coughs> um, my understanding is that the um, Russian energy connections were more with the Europe in the past. Is this uh, connection with Asia new and... Uh, um, it is, because in the past, um, I mean, if we take some numbers like, you know, 2012, I think that two-thirds of Russia's energy exports were going into Europe and um, two-thirds or and that's 12 percent of the country's total exports by value were going into Europe mm -hmm. and and you know I mean if we can take a look at the first uh, the first picture here uh, so uh, producer please uh, the number one uh, picture there that's ready so what you can see here is that the enormous spaghetti network of pipelines uh, for oil and gas that flow from Russia into into uh, into Europe and the 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 scarcity of pipeline networks and developments in in its rich resource rich uh, Siberia and so what's happened is in Europe the, the the demand peaked out in 2005 and they have a two-thirds of their their market is concentrated in uh, in Europe and uh, so the Russians have been holding their gas prices high and and uh, you know what's happened is that they, they've forced because they they've been a monopoly mm -hmm. they forced the development of competitors like uh, Norway state oil is one of them mm -hmm. um, and then they've also forced the startup of Europe's uh, oil shale development mm -hmm. so um, what happened was when they cut off the gas supplies to the Ukraine, remember that back, that, that was in 2006 and again in 2007, as a matter of foreign policy, they cut off the, the energy supplies to the Ukraine. That, that, that's right, yeah. And that whole it's, thing, it's, it's, it's it insane. backfired. <laughs> it backfired. And so uh -huh. what's happened is they've destroyed or in the process of ruining their major market. And so now they've, they've got some challenges with, with uh, also with the Chinese. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the problem that the Russians have with the Chinese is that China is starting in, in, in the development of its own shale gas. And it's interesting that the China uh, shale gas deposits are supposed to have been, or to be, 50% larger than the U.S. But the problem is uh -huh. the Chinese deposits are much deeper and more expensive to get at. Uh -huh. But just so that you know, our own American Shell Oil is committed to one billion a year to help the Chinese develop their own shale gas and shale oil. Wow. And of course, this development in China, mm -hmm. along with the new markets that, that the Chinese have developed, new pipelines into the Middle East, has scared the Russians to death because they're they're seeing China aggressively going after gas supplies mm -hmm. and, and uh, the, they have, so that there's a Russian-Chinese stalemate in, in uh, pricing negotiations. So all of these factors combined have started to push the Russian pivot towards Asia in terms of, uh, in terms of energy. Um, uh, I, I suppose uh, two things. One is uh, uh, the European uh, f uh, financial crisis is playing a role here as well, right? In, sure, in yeah, that's of, right, that's yeah. right. And the other piece is that, if you think about it, <clears throat> China has, with the, the, the recent party Congress, has this robust commitment to mm -hmm. clean air. Yeah, yeah. And so that's going to mean that China is going to move 
towards the investment and development of, of its shale gas. Mm -hmm. And that prospect scares the Russians to death because that means the Chinese won't be buying from them. I, I, I understand the Russian companies are um energy companies uh, have worked very, very hard to try to get contract uh, with the Chinese companies. And uh, there, there's some success there. Uh, but it seems like uh, different companies were competing against one another. Yes, and there's also the, the, the Russians and the Chinese have a, a long-standing history of cultural difficulty in doing business together. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a colleague of mine that has a Canadian energy company. And all he does is his company brokers energy, oil and gas, between Russian and Chinese because they don't like to talk to each other. That, that's interesting. They, they were supposed to be the uh, communist brothers, but I, I guess they had fallouts a they long had time some, ago. <laughs> they had some severe <laughs> fallout, that's right. Uh, but in terms of uh, the major players um, in Russia, in terms of energy, um, who, what are they? Who are they? Okay, well, they're, th they're basically three major players, and one of them is Gazprom, which is really an ossified, state-run monopoly exporter. And uh, the real power behind Gazprom is Putin. Putin. So let's bring up uh, image number two. Um, so this is, this is a uh, state... Owned? Correct. Mm -hmm. And Putin, uh, for many years, has been the chairman of the board of Gazprom. Mm. And so uh, that's the number one player. Uh, another one is a, a uh, an independent producer called Novatec. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're now active in Asia. We're going to see more of them in, in a minute. And the third one is a state-owned energy giant uh, with the majority shares owned by the government of Russia. And that's, that's called Rosneft. Mm -hmm. so, so those are the three major players. So we need to kind of uh, keep these uh, three in mind uh, because we're going to see some some of how they extended their Correct. pipelines into Asia. Um, okay, so this is probably a good time to take a short break because and then we're going to move into uh, uh, to talk about uh, Russian energy into Japan. And that first. is a very interesting topic. Okay, so. Um, uh, hang on there. So we're going to take a short break. This is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii, coming to, uh, to you from Pioneer Plaza. And we've been talking about Russian energy moves to Asia. When we come back, we'll learn about uh, Russian energy moves to Japan. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashen. See you next time. Hi, we're back. We're live coming to you from Pioneer Plaza at downtown Honolulu. This is Asia in Review, and uh, I'm your host, Hong Jiang. And we'll be speaking with uh, the leading international business lawyer, David Day, on the topic exciting topic of a Russian energy moves to Asia. So let's get to Japan, talk about Russian energy moving to Japan. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of Japan, we know it's a, a large consumer of energy, and it doesn't produce no. much. Well, that's right. I mean, I mean, Japan is, is the third largest oil consumer in the world, behind the U.S. and China, mm -hmm. and it is only 16% energy efficient. I mean, I, I mean, in, in, Self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. Self -sufficient. Produce only sixteen percent. Sixteen percent. That and includes the uh, the nuclear energy, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. So Let's... everything else mm -hmm. has to be imported. All their oil, mm -hmm. their coal, their their liquefied natural gas. So when you add all that up together, um, um, 
we really should take a look at the, how that, that the reality of Japan's energy. Uh, and producer, uh, let's get uh, image number three. So that, there we go. And it is, it is just an in, incredible um, display here. I mean, notice that their nuclear energy there is about 13%, and of course, that's all gone as a product of the great Tohoku earthquake mm -hmm. and the whole Fukushima incident. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they've had enormous energy losses from that, that nuclear shutdown following the, the March 11 Tohoku earthquake. Mm -hmm. And the key part here is Japan cannot replace its energy with renewables. It's not possible. And they're the world's largest liquid nat natural gas importer. Mm -hmm. So what has to happen for the economy to get back up with the energy level where it is, they have to increase efficiency, but they also have to increase imports. They have to replace that whole nuclear sector. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is driving the Japanese to a deal with the Russians big time. So did they start this deal just recent, in recent years? Um, yes, they, 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 this all uh, came a, a, as a consequence of the, the uh, APEC conference following mm -hmm. the one in Honolulu at Vladivostok in 2012. And what happened at Vladivostok, um, and I think we have a photo of this. Uh, producer, let's bring back uh, the next uh, uh, photo number four. And in this picture, what we see is, is Gazprom, when you can see Putin in the background there, they're signing a, a uh, memorandum of understanding with the Japan's uh, Agency for Energy and Natural Resources. And that deal, uh, we're going to talk about some more aspects of the deal later on, but that deal basically is the Russians and the Japanese are moving together to, to joint venture on pipelines coming into Japan from Sakhalin Island and also for joint exploration in uh, various uh, Russian seas to the north of Hokkaido Island. So the Japanese and Russians working together. And it's because Japan has to replace this, this energy. But here's the thing, Hong. Mm -hmm. After World War II, there is a problem. And there are these four islands, the Kur Isles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in order for Russia and Japan to solve all their energy problems, they're going to have to work out this long-standing problem with the Kurao Islands. So this is the islands in dispute. Uh, producer, let's bring up uh, map number five. Um, we can see the Kurao Island on the, the top right. And they're off, off the coast of Hokkaido Island there. And so here's the interesting piece of this. As a consequence of the energy, Japan has offered one island to give up to Russia. Oh, really? And Russia has offered two. Oh, wow. So they're basically one island away from resolving that problem. And you know what, Hong, I'm here to tell you the demand for energy in Japan and the demand on the part of the Russians to sell energy to mm -hmm. Japan is sufficient that it's going to fix this long-standing diplomatic dispute eventually. They'll have to get it fixed. That's interesting. And, and I wonder, in this relationship, who's gaining more if Russians giving up two islands? And I don't. I think <laughs> they're looking at the long. One. Both sides are looking at the long-term benefit from the energy. And so, as an example, I mean, to look at the strategy of two of the the uh, Russian companies with Japan, mm -hmm. Gazprom and Rosneft. So let's look at uh, image number six. That so you have both. here, what we can see is the Russian oil and gas fields on Sakhalin Island. Uh, they run a pipeline all the way down to the tip of that island at. Um, just next to Hokkaido there. And so uh, then there's another pipeline that comes down through to Vladivostok that's being completed uh, with Gazprom. So those two companies are right within striking distance of Japan. And if we can go to uh, slide number, number, seven, seven. number seven there, Mr. Producer, um, you can see the strategy is the Japanese are building a pipeline up from Tokyo into Hokkaido, and their plan is to connect the pipeline across the strait there to the uh, Rosneft terminal at the tip of Sakhalin Island. So you'll have a Russian pipeline that effectively goes to Tokyo, mm -hmm. into central Japan. And then with the Gazprom uh, terminal at Vladivostok, temporarily that gives an easy shipping run right across the Sea of Japan into central Japan. Uh, for now, so that's that's step two, and we'll come back to the the Korean hookup that will hook up central and southern part of Japan uh, in a moment here. But but to that, I think that gives you a picture of the J the Japan connection here. Um, so, 
are these pipelines being built? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. In fact, the Sakhalin Island uh, pipeline, if we can go back to photo number six, Mr. Producer, that pipeline that comes down Sakhalin Island to the tip uh, of the island there, that's done. Mm -hmm. And so all that remains is the uh, short underwater piece, which the Russians are experienced with in the Black Sea, to run across to Hokkaido. And uh, with Japanese engineering, I don't think that is going to be a challenge at, at all. And so that is, is, I don't want to say it's a done deal, but mm -hmm. you can see that it's on its way. Uh, and and it's, it seems that, that uh, two companies are involved here, uh, Gazprom and uh, Rosneft, are both involved here. Yes. Okay. Both okay. Russian companies. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. And remember that Gazprom is the Russian monopoly mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, company. Uh, and, and Rosneft is a state-owned, right? No, no. Uh, that is a major independent. Oh, that's independent. Okay. Uh, I don't know. However independent you could get in Russia. Th that's okay. right, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to tell. <laughs> All right. So these are major operations. Uh, and right now, it seems to involve both uh, the uh, pipeline through the land and also um, over the sea ship shipping. Correct. And so with the, with the big LNG, liquid natural gas terminal at Vladivostok, uh, and as well as oil, it makes it very easy for Japan to, 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 to run container ships uh, or tanker ships back and forth mm -hmm. between Vladivostok and central Japan. Easy to do. Short run, not a whole lot of risk. Uh, and so that, that is, is, a, is, a, is a piece of the overall plan, but not the complete part of it. Um, do, do you know when the gas is going to be expected to kind of be piped? I don't know the answer to that yet, and I think mm -hmm. that they they have, they of course have some uh, commercial challenges in terms of contracts, how they're going to work out, and then there is this, you know, this Kurao Island piece is is a is a low roadblock that's going to have to be mm -hmm, fixed mm -hmm. before they can really work all this out, but it, it's on its way. It's interesting you have these uh, economic connections that, that help to ease out some of the geopolitical tensions. Which well, is actually a good yeah, thing. Yeah, that's a good thing because, yeah, yeah. you know, the diplomats have been working on this problem for, what, 60 years? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like the Korean Peninsula situation. That's you know, right, the, yeah. The economics may drive a diplomatic solution, something that the diplomats could never do. That's right, yeah. So let's move to uh, the Russian case because, uh, uh, sorry, Russian to the Korean case because uh, that's where... Uh, it seems to be more interesting even than the Japan case. Well, it is, and they're related. And see, here's the thing that, that I think a lot of people don't realize is that the Russian foreign policy towards the Korean Peninsula is very different than China's. Mm -hmm. As an example, you know, Russia supports a peaceful, united Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And they see the unification of North and South Korea as a positive thing. And they're, mm -hmm. not, they're not afraid of American troops on the Yalu River like the Chinese that's, are. That's right, yeah. And, and the idea is that they could develop trade with both Koreas, and, but their, their attitude is they want to they maintain the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, but the, the, the idea is that Russia would then come in as a, to balance the three powers that gives Russia more geopolitical might, if you will, if they're a player. So they can balance South Korea, China, and Japan mm -hmm. operating around the Korean Peninsula. And this also, by moving into Korea, this helps Russia in terms of its, its situation in Siberia because they're very concerned. They have about uh, 50 million people in northeast uh, China above Harbin and above, yeah, yeah. Uh, bordering on the Amur River. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they've got something like 50,000 Russians on the other side, and they're very worried that, that China will just move into this Amur River area across mm -hmm, the border mm -hmm. to Siberia. Mm -hmm. And their feeling is that they can, they can do a deal and strengthen the Koreas that somehow the pipeline project, this is the Russian perspective now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are, uh, that they're seen as a, a, a bulwark to block the Chinese from coming over the Amur River. That's I'm not sure I, mm -hmm. I understand all the perceptions there, but I think it has to do with being able to develop that 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 uh, very low populated area of Siberia. Um, uh, by the way, my uh, hometown is Harbin. So you <laughs> <laughs> right, right? Uh, you know, okay. close <laughs> close to the Russian border, and uh, more river uh, in, um, on the China side. It's called the. The, I guess it's called the Black Dragon uh, River. 
So um, the Far East side uh, of Russia has always been less developed. Yes. And uh, very, very uh, kind of challenging, uh, even in terms of the environment. But rich. That's in so resources. Rich in resources. And that is what is so exciting about mm -hmm. this because. You know, the, there there is a business side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we've talked about the geopolitical last week. Th that's there right, is a yeah. business side to Russia's policy towards the Korean Peninsula, mm -hmm. and, and and their idea, their concept, is to link Siberia and its Far East uh, with on into the various Asia Pacific mm -hmm. economies. So mm -hmm. Vladivostok becomes a major city, major port, major financial center. Yeah, yeah. And then that then they can link that growing area mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. Russia generally. With, with the with the Moscow side basically. With the Moscow yeah. side which yeah. is which is on it's stagnant. That's but interesting. for energy. So I can actually see more clearly now it's a Russian expansion um, a connection with Asia uh, not only help Russian economy overall, but also in terms of the, inter the internal development of the Far Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and I, that's fascinating. You know, here's one little, one little quick piece here. The, 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 uh, there was a cargo train service that started up between North Korea mm -hmm. and uh, Kassan. And it started uh, in October, just one year ago, Hong, mm. and uh, carrying approximately 100,000 containers annually from Northeast Asia into Europe. Mm. And so you can see that's kind of the, the pioneering Russian version of the Trans-Siberian Railway that was always, a, always kind of a pipe dream to, mm -hmm. to, to link up those, those areas. That, and, and energy is a piece of it. That, that, that's really interesting. Uh, this is actually a good time for us to, to take a short break and, and before we get to the pipelines and uh, you know North and South Korea. Um, again, uh, this is uh, um, Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hong Jian, and we've been discussing Russian energy moves to Asia. When we come back, we'll learn more. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Hori. Mahalo. We're back. We're live. This is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii, coming to you from uh, Pioneer Plaza at downtown Honolulu. We've been speaking with uh, David Day, a leading international business lawyer, on the topic of Russian energy moves to Asia. So uh, we were just about getting into this exciting topic of a Russian connection with uh, the Northern Car South Korea. Well, remember now, we've talked about the, the whole connection with Japan earlier in the show here. And so, Hong, the big picture, if you were sitting in Moscow and you were watching your, your business stagnate and die out in Europe, the big picture is they're saying, hey, let's tap into the lucrative markets in Northern uh, to Japan mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and into South Korea. That's right, yeah. That's what we got to do. Mm -hmm. And so that would give us price leveraging over China if we have other markets so mm -hmm. we don't have to sell to China and Asia. And in that connection, let's use this energy to develop this whole energy process to develop this special economic zone on the North Korean border at, at uh, Rasan. Mm -hmm. and, and that way, we talked about before the break, this whole pipeline development, we can develop this area, we can block the Chinese expansion into, uh, uh, into Siberia, and we can also connect this whole energy with the Trans-Siberian Railway with the Trans-Korean Railway. And mm -hmm. the idea is to have a railway service that goes from Busan in South Korea up yeah. to what is now the demilitarized zone in South Korea, okay. crosses South Korea, so uh, across North, North Korea, yeah. and at Rasan, at the, the, the Russian Special Economic Zone, mm -hmm. it picks up the Trans-Siberian Railway that cuts all the way across Russia and goes to Europe. And so it would link mm -hmm. 
by rail goods and goods from the tip of South Korea all the way into Europe so, without so, going through China. So, so that means you're talking about crossing the uh, uh, the uh, DMZ zone. Yes, and of course that linking the North and South that's Korea. That's correct. That's correct. It's a very, very controversial plan, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so the the first step that the Russians uh, are talking about with the South Koreans is kind of what what you and I would call a low risk strategy. Mm -hmm. It means for now we're going to not deal with North Korea. So okay. let's take a look at what that would look like. The let's, low risk strategy. Let's bring up the next map. Yes. So in this. Um, in this map, what, what you would see is the possibility of um, uh, an undersea pipeline that runs from Vladivostok into South Korea as one, one design option. And the other, which is, um, you see the uh, bigger arrows there, is, is, is a um, kind of a bypass, North Korea bypass that runs through China. And I do not think the Russians would actually do that piece. Mm. I think they would rather make either a, by ship, temporarily a run from Vladivostok, just like they would do from Japan mm -hmm. into South Korea, or a uh, you know a, an undersea pipeline. Uh, I, I really think that they are they're going to stay away from that. But there is a high risk strategy mm -hmm. that is perhaps the most interesting. Let's one. move to the uh, next image, uh, image number nine. And so here is the one, and this, this um, actual map, I want to point out to you, uh, Hong, this was a, a kind of a forward-looking geopolitics of the 21st century, mm -hmm. mixing business and diplomacy. And this was done by the Center for International Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C., and there have been a lot of discussions about this, and that is to bring the pipeline, as you can see, down from Vladivostok to Rasson mm -hmm. at, the, at the border, and then run it down through North Korea mm -hmm. to South Korea, yeah. all the way to Busan in South Korea, and then an underwater pipeline to Fukuoka, Japan, all the way. So connect, uh, connecting basically this whole region. Uh, Absolutely. I guess we call that uh, Northeast Asia. Northeast Asia. <laughs> That's right. it, Tied in with the Russians. Yeah. And this, this North Korea piece of the deal, the Russians have already signed agreements with uh, Kim Jong-il mm -hmm. and with Kim Jong-un uh, and there of course the North Koreans are very excited about this mm. because this is a possibility for developing their country and mm. there are some people that have some reservations um, about uh, about this uh, as you might expect the, the the transit through North Korea a lot of issues to be resolved a lot of problems to be resolved but uh, mm -hmm. um, and there was there was recently uh, earlier this year there was a conference held in South Korea uh, about focusing on this this piece of the deal, which would be the transit mm -hmm. of oil and gas pipelines through North Korea, and so we can take a look. And at I this. can imagine. Um, uh, so, so a producer, if you could uh, uh, prepare to bring up uh, the video, I can imagine for South Koreans, it's more of a risk because uh, the pipelines is going through the North Korea, sure. and, and what happens to that pipeline? If There'll uh, have to be a lot of safeguards built in, mm -hmm, both mm -hmm. financial and security, and. Uh, uh, that we have to be some. I think there'll have to be some changes in North Korea mm -hmm. before this piece is put in place. But let's take a look at this discussion that was taking place in South Korea earlier this year. So, uh, a video, please. Uh. To the existing second Khabarovsk Vladivostok line to begin in September 2013, and starting in the year 2017, Russia would send 7.5 million tons of pipeline natural gas, or PNG to South Korea via North Korea every year for 30 years. The length of the pipeline running through North and South Korea will be 1,000 or 1,100 kilometers long, and the North Korean segment of the pipeline will span 700 kilometers. With that said, let's now check out the seminar and hear what participants had to say. A group of scholars and researchers on Tuesday discussed ways that South Korea would likely benefit from the direct import of Russian natural gas through a pipeline that runs through North Korea. For many South Koreans, the pipeline is seen as a major flagship project that can significantly improve inter-Korean relations and help pave the way for reunification. All Koreans should be interested in the pipeline project because it can help both Koreas begin cooperating again and open up a direct line from Korea to Europe and the rest of the world. 
And analysts say this project holds a strategic importance for Russia, as it is looking to find additional consumers in East Asia and spur growth in its Far East region. Russian ambassador to Korea, Konstantin Vlukov, attended the seminar to show Moscow's support for the project. Russia's Gazprom held fruitful negotiations with its South and North Korean counterparts. When their business talks end, and they successfully sign MOUs, Russia will start supplying natural gas to South Korea via the North from 2017. The presenters explored various benefits of the project, as well as the risk factors that need to be addressed. Experts forecast Seoul could save a significant amount of money every year by importing Russian natural gas through the pipeline, rather than relying on shipments of gas from Sakhalin. Assuming that Russian pipeline natural gas would cost 500 U.S. dollars per thousand cubic meters, South Korea can expect to save roughly 1 billion U.S. dollars in energy spending in the year 2017. This means that South Korean households could potentially cut their gas fees by 12 percent after the pipeline begins pumping natural gas or PNG. However, the panelists added that the risks associated with North Korea's involvement could alter the calculations. I personally think that North Korean risks are great. From our previous dealings with the country, the level of trust South Korea has with the North is low. Because of this low level of trust, moving forward with the project because of its potential economic benefits is rather far-fetched. To ensure that North Korea does not disrupt the flow of gas under any circumstances, South Korea may have to pay additional fees to Russia in premiums, which could snowball into much higher expenses for Seoul. Therefore, the panelists emphasize the importance of finding a workable insurance system for North Korean risks and setting gas and transit fees at a reasonable level. The experts agree that the South Korea-Russia gas pipe business via North Korea could economically benefit all three countries. However, they stress that coming up with a means to ensure the safety of gas transit to South Korea is key to advancing the tripartite energy project. And that's just amazing to see the yeah, kind of that risk incredible? that's involved. Yeah. yeah the, 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 the risk, uh, and of course, the South Koreans naturally very concerned about having North Korea block the pipeline, turn the valve off, use it for ransom, or whatever. And so there'll have to be safeguards built in, maybe a bypass line if they try to do something, or tremendous economic advantage, uh, you know, disincentives to doing this. But Hong, here's the part that's really fascinating, is that you can see how this transiting of North Korea could provide two things. One, energy that North Korea desperately needs, mm -hmm. and two, an economic a, a, a cash flow, a, a stream that could be used to develop the country. Now, admittedly, mm -hmm. there may have to be a regime change in order to make this piece work, but this is a, in my mind, is a fascinating example of how private sector development mm -hmm. in big projects could really impact the whole security of the Korean Peninsula and the, the eventual bringing of, of North Korea into the community of nations. That's really interesting. So financially, there might be just enough incentive for the North Koreans to behave well to, for their own benefit, to allow this pipeline to go through. That also means a improved relationship with South Korea and with the rest of the world, hopefully. Absolutely. And I, and I think that there's no question that, that <laughs> Nobody's going to do that deal. Mm -hmm. Even the Russians are not going to do that deal unless those safeguards are in place. Because the Russians, remember, they got to make sure that the, the, the energy safely crosses North Korea to the consumer. That's, that's right. Who, it's who's going to pay for it, right? In the interest of, of everybody right. to, to make sure that goods is delivered. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. That's interesting. So we're going to take uh, our last break before the concluding session. Um, this is Asia in Review at Think Tech Hawaii, and we've been discussing Russian energy moves to Asia. We're taking a short break. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaiian Foreign Trade Zone, number nine, has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. 
DBED, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program. It does so to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. Hi, we're back. We're live coming to you from Pioneer Plaza at downtown Honolulu. I'm your host, Hong Jiang, and uh, we've been speaking with David Day, a leading international business lawyer, about uh, Russian energy moves to Asia. So we kind of uh, ran through these uh, big projects and the large maps of uh, Russian energy pipes going to Japan and going to the North and South Korea. And uh, let's uh, uh, try to understand the Korean part just a little bit before we uh, bring the whole region map up. Um, so the, the Korean uh, connection there, so it's in the planning stage? Yes, and you can see that major mm -hmm. conference in Seoul, which okay. is what we just saw before the break, in discussing the advantages and mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. and disadvantages. And, and the Russians have, have uh, spent enormous sums of money on engineering feasibility studies mm -hmm. for these various pipeline projects coming down through Hokkaido Island in, to Japan and through the Koreas to Busan in South Korea. Uh, and so, you know, it. This it, could happen quickly, you know, just a matter of maybe a certain uh, number, a couple, a few, couple few, years. A couple years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And so the North Korea piece, of course, is, is the most sensitive, the most difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but there are ways to build in safeguards. And the other pieces of the whole picture could be created, built, and in service. Mm -hmm. And then the North Korea piece put in last after the North Koreans see, hey, we're going to get left out. Mm -hmm. And right, so yeah. to really appreciate this, I mean, let's take a look at the, the kind of the in-game, the big picture that the Russians have in mind here. And so the map, uh, the next map, yes, coming up. And so this is, this is kind of the, the in-game picture, what the Russians are looking at in terms of coordination with the Koreas and with Japan. And so you can see, you know, basically one Russian pipeline that comes into North Korea from China, the other two and that one comes down from Siberia. And the other two come from Russian soil, one down through Vladivostok to North Korea, and the other down through Sakhalin Island into Hokkaido, Japan. And the idea is to, to hook up a complete circuit so that Hokkaido all the way to uh, Kagoshima in the southern part of Japan are all linked up with Russian energy uh, pipelines for at least starting with liquid natural gas and perhaps in the future oil. Um, so that the whole Japanese chain of islands, mm -hmm. you know, generally speaking, are That's supplied right. with energy, yeah, yeah. and the Korean Peninsula is supplied, and that, of course, makes Russia a big player business-wise and a big player in the region geopolitically. And, and that's uh, the fascinating part of it, because uh, we're talking about Asia, we're talking about all these different players. Of course, you have the Korea, uh, uh, North Korea there, you have the Japan, the U.S. has a close connection with South Korea and with Japan, and here Russia comes in and link everything. So uh, how would you speculate the impact of this uh, energy pipeline in terms of uh, a Russian's role in Asia? Of course, it's going to increase. Uh, dramatically, right? And and yes. what other aspect you can imagine this would impact? Well, I think that, <clears throat> first of all, the, the Japanese and the South Koreans are going to be very careful about relying on Russian energy mm. because of their experience in watching what Russia did in the Ukraine. I think Russia will be very reluctant to do a Ukraine repeat in Asia because it will destroy their ability to do business <laughs> anywhere. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. So there's that aspect of it. There's the North Korea piece, which we've talked about. That's right. Yeah. And then the other interesting piece to speculate about is remember that coming on as as either the number two and potentially the number one energy producer in the world mm -hmm. with the oil, shale, and liquid uh, gas shale development is the United States. Mm -hmm. And so the U.S. Uh, could become the number one exporting country for energy mm -hmm. uh, very soon. And so 
the, the Russians will then be competing with the Americans. One thing, uh, though, the Russians are closer, you know, ge ge geographically. And uh, so if these pipelines are laid, then Russia would have uh, a, a lot of uh, kind of uh, advantage in sure, terms of being the first pro provider. But here's the thing. With the U.S. as a competitor, it will help keep the Russians honest mm -hmm. and keep their fingers pricing. away from pr on pricing and mm -hmm. keep their fingers away from using the shutoff valve <laughs> as, a, right. as, a, as an instrument of foreign policy. Do you that, see what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, what is the risk for Russia? You know, uh, we talk about the, the energy expansion is an important economic policy for, for Russia. And of course, uh, it's almost like, like you said, uh, for uh, Saudi Arabia, without the, the oil, uh, what, what else? And you have to do this, right? But uh, we already see the impact of uh, economic slowdown in Russia uh, coming from connections uh, with Europe. And, and any kind of risk over there? In the, in the Asian connection here? Well, the Asian, the risk in the Asian connection is that if Russia doesn't do it right, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they don't do it uh, with integrity, they will effectively destroy their ability to work in the Asia Pacific region because the other Asian countries won't trade with them. Mm -hmm. And so this is a chance for Russia to have what I call a fresh start mm -hmm. in a new region of the world uh, in, in a large business sense. And, you know, Hong, they, they have to make this pivot from Europe into Asia. Mm -hmm. And all they have to work with, it's kind of like the oil in Saudi Arabia. They it's the oil. That's all they have mm -hmm. is the energy. And so they have to make it work and they have to kind of um, suck it up and take the risk. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's really interesting. So, you know, in, um, see, I teach geography at UH. Um, and, uh, uh, world Regional Geography is one of, one of the courses I offer. It, it, the textbooks and, and uh, all the experts have a hard time placing Russia. Russia became independent. It's both Asia and Europe, right? And uh, now, with the pipelines, uh, I guess Russia becomes more Asia. Yes, and that's that, and because in the past, you have this one port, Vladivostok, mm -hmm. and then you have all this open land that's effectively undeveloped in all of Siberia, rich in resources, undeveloped, and they weren't really doing much in the way of business in, in, uh, in Asia. I mean, a few bits and pieces in, mm -hmm. in Vietnam, some energy stuff that they're working in, in, in Vietnam. But by and large, uh, you know, and they've had a rough time in working with the Chinese. And mm -hmm. so this is an opportunity for them to develop a whole new market. This is really something we need to watch in the next few years and then see where, you know, Russia is going, where the pipelines go, are going, and also, you know, the impact on um, the geopolitical um, relations and dynamics in the whole region of Northeast Asia. Well, you're right. And I, and I think what, what, what's going to happen is we're going to see, just as in the Middle East, mm -hmm. Russia is going to be not only back, mm -hmm. but they will be a big player. Okay, pay attention. We're just out of time, and uh, I'm Hong Jiang. This is Asia in Review. We've been speaking with uh, um, international business lawyer David Day, also the uh, Asia in Review host on Thursdays. And we've been talking about this fascinating topic of Russia energy moves to Asia. And thank you so much, David, it's great. for joining well, thank us. You. Thank you for hosting the show. And I want to thank uh, our production manager, Ian Davison, and the communications director, Chrissy Galfigan, and of course, our producer, Jay Fidel. And we want to thank you, the, view, uh, the viewers, for tuning in. And uh, this is Asia in Review. I'm Hong Jiang, and uh, I'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you, and goodbye.